Again, we have um, put together this panel about the special period, which begins in 1991 with the fall of the Soviet Union and the dissolution of the Comecom, and then when it ends, will be determined by our panelists. There are different uh, opinions about that. So I uh, would like to welcome our panel uh, first, uh, um, our colleague from the Milner Center and from CUNY, uh, Mario Gonzalez Corso, uh, Associate Professor in the Department of Economics at Lehman, will contextualize the uh, events that gave rise to the special period and then uh, he will be followed by my colleague from the World Community College, Ernesto Menendez Conde, who's uh, editor in chief of uh, the online magazine The Art Experience in uh, New York City. And lastly, uh, Ileana Cepero, a former curator of the Fototeca de Cuba and assistant curator of the Montreal Biennale of 2007 and co curator of the Blockbuster 2008 exhibit at Montreal, which is where I met her. Uh, in Cuba art and history from 1868 to today, we we'll talk about how the special period had an uh, impact uh, on photography. And uh, Ernesto will focus on art and film. And uh, um, Iliana will talk about uh, uh, photography. So, without further delay, uh, we begin with Mario. Thank you. Thank you, Ana Maria. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for attending our panel. Um, I want to begin by thanking Mauricio Font and the staff of the Builder Center for organizing this event. Um, I also want to thank Ana Maria, uh, Professor Ana Maria Hernandez, uh, for moderating the panel uh, and for inviting me to be here this afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in the panel. Um, I'm really delighted by the fact that my colleagues agreed to have an economist uh, participating in a panel about art, so um, <laughs> about Cuban art in the special period. So I hope to learn a lot about Cuban art in the special period today. Um, when I was invited to uh, participate in the panel, I really thought about what, what exactly could I say about special period, about the Cuban economy during a special period without, you know, within the time constraint of 20 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever time we have. And I wanted to contextualize the, uh, the process of the special period and, and share my impressions with you today. So what I decided to do was basically break down my presentation into two topics. And um, the first one is basically, uh, I'll present an overview of the effects of the economic crisis of the 1990s on the Cuban economy. Then I'll talk about the, uh, the uh, economic adjustments that Cuba implemented in response to the crisis between 1990 and 94, so only that period. And then finally, I'll talk about the impact of those adjustments on some um, microeconomic uh, indicators. And then, uh, of course, towards the end, I'll offer some concluding remarks. Um, just in the interest of time, uh, when we talk about the economy of the special period, uh, it could, you know, the conversation could turn quite lengthy. So I limited my presentation to the economic adjustments that Cuba implemented with, re with regards to the domestic economy. <coughs> So when we think about special period, basically this is uh, known in Cuba as periodo especial en tiempos de paz. And it was basically declared uh, back in 1989, but it was implemented in early 1990. And it began as an energy conservation program. And the idea was to save fuel around 150,000 tons of crude oil, and then followed that with a food program that was designed to substitute food imports, and, and of course reduce the dependency of Cuba on imported food. Um, what happens, of course, is that the disappearance of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Council of Mutual Economic Assistance, the disappearance of the socialist camp led to a major contraction on Cuban GDP. And so what I have here in table one is basically showing you a table showing you the contraction of Cuban GDP between 1990 and 1993. So if you aggregate those numbers, it's a little bit, it's slightly over 40% contraction in GDP. Now think of any economy, whether it's an insular economy like Cuba with a high degree of dependency or a large economy like the United States, think about what a 40% contraction of GDP would mean. So for Cuba, it meant that uh, the decline of oil imports from the USSR, we had the decline of intermediate and, and finished capital goods um, from the socialist camp in 1989. So the impact of those declines, and I'll talk about those declines shortly, it's basically massive reductions in the productive capacity of the country, massive reductions in public transportation, 
excessive blackouts, apagones. Uh, the Cubans have a sense of humor, so they call it abumbrones. Uh, <laughs> closures of schools and other public facilities to save energy and resources, the lack of spare parts. Um, I'll be more than happy to tell you a lot of personal stories because my, my family comes from a, worked in the transportation ministry and what the inventiveness of Cubans, you know, to deal with the lack of spare parts and so on. What everybody knows, of course, is that this led to the substitution of buses and trucks and tractors and so on with uh, horse-drawn carriages, oxen, bicycles, and so on. And then what we have, of course, is austerity measures implemented, right, to cut back on energy and to cut back not only on energy used to produce electricity, but also on energy used to for transportation. So the transportation sector really contracted. Another major uh, component of the contraction was the decline in sugar production. So you have a decrease in sugar production uh, from around 8 million metric tons in 1989, which um, um, 8.4 million metric tons in 1990, all the way to 4.2 million metric tons by 1993. So of course, all connected to the lack of imports uh, from the former socialist camp. Uh, the other uh, way to illustrate the impact of the special period on the Cuban economy, the macro impact, is by looking at the merchandise trade. And, and of course, Cuba has been and remains and will more than likely remain forever a, an external uh, a country with a high degree of external sector dependency. And so if you look at table number three, we have a very dramatic decrease in merchandise import, export. Exports declined 67%. And again, this is only the period from 1989 to 1993. Then we have imports also collapsing by around, 40, uh, by around 77%. Just to put it in perspective, I have two little pieces of data here that are very significant. And just on the eve of the special period, just by, 1999, by 1989, 1990, Cuba imported 75 to 80% of its merchandise came from the socialist bloc. So it was a, higher, a very high degree of uh, external sector dependency. Just to put this also into perspective, the Soviet subsidies, I did a calculation, and they reached an average between 1960 and 1990 of around $2.1 billion per year. That's not counting indirect subsidies. These are basically the direct subsidies I was able to calculate. And so in terms of the external sector, you can see by looking at table number three, the massive shock that the Cuban economy suffered uh, between 1989 and 1993. So the responses of Cuba to the special period. Mostly everybody here probably remembers self-employment, agricultural reforms. You probably remember agricultural markets, and I'll talk about those. But before we talk about those, you know, very significant um, adjustments were the austerity measures on the food program. And when, when we look at austerity measures, we're looking at basically a contraction, a forced contraction of, for example, shutting down productive capacities all over the country, uh, delaying opening a new refinery that was scheduled to open in 1990 in Cienfuegos, reductions of fuel delivery, deliveries to the state sector, reductions to the non-state sector, reduction in electricity, and so on. And then we have a second phase of austerity measures, right? And so we have the closure of te te uh, textile mills, the closure of factories, Reducing cement production. This one really caught my attention. And what I calculated, I went back to get some data. What I found was that cement production fell in Cuba between 1990 and 1992 only around 62.5%. So you could imagine the impact this would have on the housing stock, the impact on the infrastructure, <coughs> the impact on the healthcare infrastructure, and so on. Then another part of the austerity measure implemented in, in, uh, in 1990 was basically a reduction of cooking gas and kerosene supplies and increasing food rationing. So the response was to implement a, an austerity measure to cut back on consumption, right? So this is a demand side shock resulting from a supply shock that the economy suffered. And then we have between 1991 and 1992, things get worse. So you have further cuts in electricity consumption of 20% in the state sector, 10% cut back on electricity supply to the non-state sector, reductions in the city of Havana by 25, 30%, and so on. And so that was the first stage of the austerity program. The second stage of the austerity program came with this idea of reliance, of turning Cuba into a self-sufficient nation in terms of food production. By the way, this is something that's being discussed in Cuba today, as a matter of fact. It has been discussed since the process of actualization, the model economic, the updating of the economic model began in 2007, 2008. So, so there are remnants of the food program. The, the whole idea of the food program implemented between 1990 and 91 
or 92, I should say, was basically to increase food production, to cut back on imports of food. Of course, as you know, if anyone who follows the statistics uh, of U.S. and, and um, of U.S. sales of agricultural products to Cuba will realize that that hasn't been achieved. Um, but the second objective was basically to increase the production of export crops. What we have here, if you follow um, what happened with the food program, and, and you count that as one of the uh, policy adjustments of the special period, which it was, it was one of the most significant ones, you have a return to this gigantic mindset uh, that, that percolated throughout the early years of the Cuban Revolution, which means we can put ourselves uh, through our own self-sufficiency, and Cuba could become basically an autarkic state producing its own food and so on. I, I wanted to share with you what, what were some of the forecasts in terms of production output increases that were needed to accomplish the goals of the food program. And we have an increase in milk production of 121%, an increase in sugar production, for example, of 39%. So sugar production went down 50% now to get back according to the food program. It had to increase by 39, almost 40%. An increase in vegetables and tubers of, 40, of almost 50%. But more than that, implementing the food program required an excessive amount of resource allocation, an increase in the amount of land under irrigation. Irrigation is very uh, labor intensive and also capital intensive in a place like Cuba. And they were planning in just five years to increase quite dramatically the amount of land that was irrigated. Here, if you look at the second bullet, in terms of resource allocation, look at what I have here. Mobilizing an estimated 200,000 workers for 15 days a year to work in the fields. Going back to the early 1960s, going back to the massive, even to 1970, right, the 10-year uh, sugar harvest. Going back to the massive um, mobilization campaigns as a way to, uh, for Cuba to basically pull itself out of the ditch of the special period. Another um, provision of the food program was the creation of a nationwide network of storage facilities and warehouses and so on. But the problem with all this was that it, it was heavily dependent on imports. And Cuba did not have the, the hard currency to import, to finance the import of all the resources besides labor that were necessary to implement the food program. So then the Cuban government, by 1992, uh, Fidel realizes that uh, just to give you a sense, between 1990 and 1992, imports of fertilizers fell by 62%. So instead of increasing, imports of fertilizers declined. Imports of irrigation equipment fell by about, around 35% during the same period. So it would be impossible to implement the food program. So then you have, as, as a consequence of the, uh, of, of the failure, really, of the food program, then you have the summer of reforms of 1993 and 1994. And so these are the ones that most people are familiar with, right? The legalization of the US dollar after the Treaty of 140. So basically, you have the creation of a dual monetary system. Ordinary Cubans were authorized to use dollars to purchase consumer goods in the, in the tienda de, de recaudación de divisa, in the so called dollar stores. Uh, also, something that was new was it allowed um, ordinary Cubans to have access to uh, bank accounts that were denominated in US dollars. And by the way, these were interest bearing accounts. So for the first time after the revolution, you could actually open an account um, with US dollars. Behind this, of course, the idea was to stimulate the influx of remittances and to capture those remittances through indirect taxation, through the sales in the, in the dollar stores and so on. Mm -hmm. Then we have, in September of 1993, we have uh, something that's very popular now, which is self-employment. The legalization of self-employment, this is not the first time the self-employment is legalized in Cuba. There was another degree in, in 19, another decree in 1978 which authorized legal self-employment for the first time. But here we have an expansion of legal self-employment, and so it includes up to 117 activities. One of the provisions, though, was that professionals, doctors, professors, and so on were excluded from being self-employed, which is still the case today. Um, Self-employed workers were required to pay income taxes using a, a quite a convoluted tax system. And the idea was to bring some people from the informal economy into the formal economy to pay taxes and so on. Also, to cut something that I'm sure many people in this room have heard already um, under actualización del modelo económico, which is to cut back to reduce the excessively bloated payrolls in the state sector. The same thing that was done back in 1993 was announced in 2010, but with a larger magnitude. So, Self-employment, by the way, um, towards the end of 1999, the, at the time, the Minister of the Economy, Jose Luis Rodriguez, said that uh, we cannot convert Cuba into a country of um, small enterprises and use that as a panacea for development. 
What he said in Spanish, no podemos convertir a Cuba en un país de chinchales. <laughs> chinchales means small business, and that's not the panacea for, uh, <laughs> you know, for, for economic development. Uh, so he was very critical. He still remains quite critical uh, publicly about uh, regarding self-employment. Then we have, um, of course, agricultural reforms. Okay, And then we have two major sets of agricultural reforms. And, and what we have is the conversion of a, a significant number of state farms into a new uh, type of cooperative uh, known as the Unidades Básicas de Producción Cooperativa. And these were basically quasi-state farms that, or cooperatives that were given a little bit more, uh, a little bit greater degree of autonomy compared to the old um, you know, state farms. So, uh, and, and then uh, that was decreed 142 back in 1993. And then we have the creations, or I should say the reintroduction of the farmer's market. And, and here basically, the Cuban government realizes that there has to be a mechanism, there has to be an output market where excess production, uh, agricultural production could be sold. And, and by the way, the creation of these agricultural markets was really intended to stimulate production in the cooperative sector, not to stimulate private production. That's a misconception. The idea was to, to provide a, a venue for the cooperatives to sell their excess production. So one thing that was new in terms of agricultural reforms was the function of, of intermediaries, which were called under Decree uh, 191 from 1994. These were called representantes, representatives. These were basically salespeople who would go to the farm and purchase a produce from the farmers and resell it in the agricultural markets in the city. I don't, unfortunately, have enough time to, go, to, to get into the details of the complexity of the agricultural markets, but these were, um, in fact, one of the major reforms that were implemented. So what were some of the what was the impact of some of these reforms at, at, at various levels? And, and so we have the recovery of GDP after 1994. As you can see in table number four, we have GDP recovering beginning in 1994 and reaching an annual growth rate of 7.8% by 1996. So of course, the recovery of GDP was led by the legalization of the US dollar, by the influx of, of remittances, by foreign direct investment, by tourism, and so on. Then, then we have something that some people don't really like to, to mention, which is improvement in some sectors of the Cuban economy, agriculture, construction, and so on. Now, these improvements, of course, were in comparison to um, 1993, not in comparison to 1989, 86, 87, or so on. Uh, so we have inflows of, of foreign direct investment. We have, if you look at table five, we have uh, the balance of payments of Cuba becoming more stable. So the import capacity of the country inc increases, so does the export capacity. And if you look at the bottom of the table, notice the increase in private transfers. We have a massive increase in private transfers, which is basically, which were primarily remittances, right? So, so we have remittances growing, and again, being one of the engines that, of growth for the Cuban economy during that period. So exports increased by 69%, in ex uh, merchandise exports grew by around 74%, services grew by 65%. Today, services are the engine of exports in Cuba. Imports went up by 88%. Cuba borrowed a lot of money uh, to finance those imports. And of course, remittances grew quite dramatically. Um, international tourism. I, I cannot talk about the Cuban economy after a special period without saying something about tourism. And this is another very complex story. But in terms of gross earnings, those grew by 91%. And the number of visitors increased by 81% compared to 1993. This is by the end of 1996. The uh, one story, if you talk to a Cuban economist, they will tell you, one of the success stories of the recovery of Cuba after a special period was balancing the fiscal deficit. And if you look at the fiscal deficit as a ratio of GDP, uh, this is table seven, back in 1993 it was 31%, almost 31% of GDP. By the end of 1996, it was reduced to uh, the deficit around 2.3% of GDP. But guess how Cuba was able to, to, to stabilize itself fiscally? By increasing taxes by around 24%. Uh, by uh, applying taxes to cooperatives, and of course, something also that is very, uh, there's data about it, but, but it's so, you know, many times people don't talk about it, which is basically increasing prices of services and some goods. Cutting back on fiscal expenditures by 13% during that period. Uh, so, so we have all these factors, the confluence of these factors resulting in reducing the deficit. I have two more, and then I'm gonna move on to my closing remarks. Um, between 1993 and 1996, Cuba um, basically stabilized the, the uh, reduced the amount of excess liquidity. That this is this is an accomplishment for a socialist economy to cut back on excess liquidity on monetary overhang as a ratio of GDP. 
And then, of course, the other success story was, uh, in terms of you know bringing macroeconomic stability, was basically reducing the unofficial exchange rate between the peso and the dollar. Okay, and, and there were mechanisms. Again, this is a complex monetary story, but I just wanted to show you the data. So, between 1989 and 1993, of course, the disintegration of the USSR and the socialist bloc really dealt a severe blow to the Cuban economy. The response to that was something called the special period. That we still debate whether the special period is over, whether Cuba is working on the special period or not. Um, I'm going to uh, skip over my summary and jump to the last two bullets in the bottom. And the conclusion is basically this. Cuba was able to recover gradually from the abyss of 1993. But it was unable, it has not been able, not even up until now, to achieve the levels of 1989. Most economists, we like to use 1989 as a bench year for comparison purposes. So all the measures, all the indicators are well below 1989 levels. And the other final conclusion that I can offer as a way to segue into the other, perhaps more interesting presentations, is that uh, these adjustments, these economic adjustments were implemented in Cuba, somewhat reluctantly, but they were implemented nonetheless, uh, particularly during this, the, the early stages of the special period. In my view, I think they transformed Cuban society forever. And I quite frankly think that the impact of these is still being felt today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. That's a very important context that we need for our next speaker, Ernesto Menendez Gomez. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me see how can I. Uh, oh. How can I make it? Uh, Thank you very much uh, to. Uh, uh, Thank you very much to Mauricio Font for inviting me to this panel. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I will talk uh, a little bit about films during the special period and a little bit about visual arts. Uh, all right, okay. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, it was great to have Mario uh, talking about the economy uh, because uh, obviously there was uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union there was obviously uh, a tremendous collapse in Cuban economy. Uh, but there was not only an economic collapse, but also uh, what I would say is an ideological collapse. Uh, during the years of the uh, early 90s, uh, there was a strong belief, disbelief in socialism. It was totally different to when I was living in Cuba in the 80s. And uh, we used to believe, well, things are not going well, but still we are working for the future and our children will do better and so forth. So the idea of the utopia, which has, was very powerful probably in the 60s, goes to an end. Uh, during the special period. And uh, particularly in films, we have uh, what I would like to call counter utopias. So I will read uh, what I wrote here. The term periodo especial is misleading. It suggests a somehow brief historical moment, provisionally and perhaps remarkably different to what comes before and after it. But this is not the case of the Periodo Especial in Cuban society. It officially began in uh, December uh, 1990, although in a speech dated in September 28, Castro already said without doubt, we are already entering in the special period in times of peace. And apparently it hasn't finished yet. Uh, in a recent uh, writing, uh, Castro said uh, that uh, we are still in the special period, and that was uh, January 25th this year. So apparently we are still uh, are in the special period, but it has lasted like a, almost a quarter a century. So it's a special, uh, especially long. <laughs> <laughs> However, I would say for many Cubans, the special period may reach an end by October uh, 1994 with the uh, reopening of the farmer market, which was closed uh, in, in the 80s 
and there was a tremendous crisis with um, food and the farmer market uh, solved this uh, problem and I think that puts an end to what was at least the most critical moment of the special period. Um, what seems different in these four years that go from 1990 and 1994 was not the scarcity which Cubans endured in other historical moments before and after the early 90s, but the collapse, the collapse of the ideological horizon of the revolution and the belief in the uh, terrifying and somehow Orwellian future which was about to come. Uh, I find it difficult to think uh, the early 90s without talking about this belief in the advent uh, of a despite devastating future that will even be more dramatic than the present. Uh, this immediate and perhaps apocalyptic future was promoted even by the government. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, the idea of periodo especial en tiempos de paz, which, which is not very good, but they suggest there are period, there is periodo especial en tiempos de guerra, which would be even worse than this. And this actually affects the urban landscape. And I want to show some pictures about it. Uh, but, uh, let me see. Uh, so <clears throat> the idea of a possible war affected the urban, uh, urban landscape. Regardless of the limited material resources, Fidel Castro asked to wield tuneres populares. And this is a picture uh, taken by artist Los Carpinteros of uh, these uh, tuneres populares. Uh, I think the pictures were taken uh, uh, in 1999, so a few years after they were built. Um, and these uh, refugios populares will be used supposedly as a refuge against bombings in the event of an American invasion. Many Cubans really fear that uh, these tunnels will be used in order to imprison uh, opponents of the government in case of social uh, havens. And then, uh, if you see these pictures, well, how can I go back? It's, it's strange, uh, 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 the, the idea of the prison and the refuge is really confusing or ambiguous here. Um, by those years, people start talking about the forthcoming option zero, and this is another counter utopia promoted by the government. Uh, society will supposedly survive without oil, zero oil, that's what zero means. Uh, people would be transferred to the countryside, they couldn't be public transportation, no means of communication, no electricity, and they will be uh, surviving by drinking collective growth. Uh, work, work in the land and living in camps. Uh, so this is, this is a, uh, a counter utopia. Then we have this motto of Fidel Castro uh, began to use uh, during that year, so Socialismo Muerte. And uh, humans were making fun of this uh, slogan by adding uh, Valga la Redundancia. So how can I translate this? <laughs> Socialismo muerte, while it's redundant or something like that. Uh, so, uh, but the uh, late 80s, and I have this picture here, uh, young artist Aldito Menendez growing this show, held uh, probably, uh, you will remember this show, uh, this show held at the uh, Facultad de Artes y Letras in La Habana, and then he grow Reviva la Revolu. So, relive the revolution. The revolution. And a few uh, months later, another artist, Sandra Ceballo, wrote in the wall of a hospital, Salvese quien pueda. for uh, <laughs> himself. Both sentences could help to illustrate the gap between the days in which artists believe they can really helped to change society, and the early night is signed by an apocalyptic horizon. I would like to discuss these pessimistic visions of the future by using two Fernando Perez films. The first one is Madagascar, screened screen in 1994. The second one is Sweet Havana, made almost 10 years later. Both movies were set in poor neighborhoods in which characters have to do endure uh, everyday life harsh conditions. 
Still, if we pay attention to dreams, and I would argue these films are about dreams, it seems obvious that we have two diametrically opposed visions. Madagascar begins with a voiceover of the main character called Laura, who apparently is visiting a therapist. She says, I sleep, doctor. I sleep and I dream, but I dream the same reality of the everyday life. But other people live in 12 hours, I live in 24 hours. I want to have different, a different dream. From this moment on, it really doesn't matter whether we are watching uh, the everyday life or a nightmare, since the main character, the one who tells the story, Laura, cannot distinguish one from the other. The whole, the whole film is purposely claustrophobic, and viewers uh, probably will miss a ray of light or some bright colors. Obscurity prevails in interior spaces, including Laura's working place, and <clears throat> And everyone, uh, every time John Laurita, the daughter of the main character, uh, opens a window, we see a gray leaden sky. Everyone but Laurita seems <coughs> exhausted. Um, the peers of uh, Laura, who works at the university, are also frustrated. And there is a character, which is a very curious character, uh, <coughs> that he's reading aloud some optimistic news in the newspapers. However, this triumphalist contents immediately sounds fake and somehow idiotic, since due to the monotonous voice, voice of tone of his voice, uh, he renders the impression of an alienated person. So the one who could be optimistic is reading just the news and he really uh, looks like a very uh, alienated character. The film ends with the same words it began, <clears throat> as if we were attending to a secret repetition of the same discontent. But this time it's not Laura, the one who tells him, but Laurita, uh, <clears throat> who is now defeated, uh, because now she's uh, dreaming with the same reality they had in the everyday life. And the trip to the uh, uh, Madagascar, which is Laurita's dream, and then it becomes a mother's dream, suggests the desperate desire to escape from reality. And now we have Sweet Havana, which is, was made 10 years later. Uh, Sweet Havana follows a day in the life of eight characters. If we think of Sweet in the sense of a luxurious architectural space, like the ones in a hotel or an office building, the title of the film obviously contracts with the locations. Since all characters live in poor houses, sometimes among ruins, surrounded by worn furniture and unpainted walls. Instead of alluding to architecture, the word suite seems more related to a musical form, comprised of a set of, uh, of orchestral pieces that are related to each other, like suite packs, uh, orchestral suites, and so forth. Uh, in, order, in order to enhance this connotation of the word suite, uh, Perez decided his character wouldn't speak. We hear Cuban songs, environmental, environmental sounds, and some industrial noises of engines, of tools, machines, all these noises which suggests suggest labor. The film seems to have an overture, like a musical suite, and the overture will be like the down in which uh, we see a hard, there is a hard rain and we have the statue of John Lennon and it's raining, and someone is watching uh, the statue. And the rhythm becomes more enthusiastic in the evening, like the second part of the film. Uh, and the evening is a moment of dreams. The, the word sweet wouldn't refer to the, the materiality of a luxurious architecture, but rather to immaterial sounds, to, to a sweet comprise of sounds taken from the everyday life, from national traditions, and from national traditions. The film develops the idea of material poverty as a source of spirituality, which we'll also find in more uh, recent films, such as Barrio Cuba, Havana Station, and even in Conducta. If you uh, see Conducta, uh, there are many social problems as a result of poverty, but there still there are spiritual values in this poverty. Uh, so it seems this. Uh, Nightmarish vision uh, we find in Madagascar 
and fade away. So uh, after 1994, 1995, people perhaps were a little bit more optimistic than before. Uh, so I will talk now about these uh, pessimistic years, how filmmakers uh, uh, render the ideas of the apocalyptic horizon. Oh, sorry. All right. Uh, first, there was the, the depiction of a totalitarian leader. Uh, and this was something new that uh, emerged in the late 80s and early 90s. We have now uh, films about someone who rules society in a very totalitarian manner. There are many examples. I don't have to talk about them. Uh, but the most well-known, obviously, is Alicia in El Pueblo de las Maravillas. But then we can, we can find this totalitarian leader in, in other films, and sometimes disguised as a woman. And there are two movies in which is totally unrecognizable today. Uh, I watched the movies be before coming here, and it was unable to get the reference to uh, Fidel Castro, because it was really very obscure. Uh, in these films, there are also claustrophobic, uh, claustrophobic environments. Uh, Madagascar is an example. I will, uh, and there is the idea of surveillance. So everyone is watching each other. In a movie called um, El Elefante y la Bicicleta, uh, people ended up watching to each other and leaving the theater. Uh, and then the triumphalist propaganda is portrayed like quiche, something tasteless, out of fashion, and nobody believes in this, and it's really even funny. And finally, ruins and uh, poor neighborhoods are regarded as uh, metaphors of the uh, ideological decay of the society. And an example of this is the magazine uh, <coughs> Memorias de la Postguerra, uh, which artista Tania Bruguera made. And uh, she obviously mentions the ruins of the street of the city as a metaphor of the end of an ideological war. Um, so, that's it. thank you very much. Thank you. So now, uh, Ileana will talk about photography Okay, uh, thank you very much to the Vendor Center, to Mauricio Pond, and especially Ana Maria. <laughs> who kindly invited me to be here today. So I'm going to talk about photography in the 90s, and I would like to begin with this image by Umberto Mayor. So as you can see, um, these men are pushing this, uh, this truck, and the truck has scary coffins. Mm -hmm. And the title of the photograph is The Last Push, El Ultimo Empujón. <laughs> so they likely, they're likely pushing the truck to the, I mean, uh, the truck likely broke or even out of fuel. So they're pushing it to the curb to wait for a mechanic or to find some fuel supply. So the image is funny and pointed at the same time. It was so funny that he got an award in the seventh international biennial Humor, humor Biennial of San Antonio de los Baños in Cuba in 1990. But it's very poignant because proper wake and burial, the right to have a sudden death, has to wait because uh, a severe scarcity has inflicted the island. So the image ominously encapsulates what would be the course of the years of the country from that year on. Like the driver and his friends, Cubans were forced to push a broken body. In this case, it was the body of the nation, which was on the verge of dissolution. So this presentation will demonstrate how photography in the 90s was used as a critical tool to uh, document the malaise, the malaise of the Cuban society at the time pervaded by scarcity, hopelessness, and isolation. But the bright side of that is that for photography, while the government was really busy trying to navigate the, cris the crisis, that really opened a door to photography to approach things that until that moment were almost taboo. 
And these themes were poverty, racism, migration, religion, and queer culture. So the highlight um, of the uh, 80s, of the late 80s, because we have to remember that Phototeca de Cuba, which is the only institution devoted to photography in Cuba, was created in 1986 by the late Maria Eugenia Aya Marusha. So preceding the 90s, there was a very important show in 1988 of Sebastián Salgado called Other Americas. So for the first time, the Cuban audience could see a photo template combining highly aestheticized images and social content with a strong Latin American flavor. flavor. So in 1990, Phototeca promoted a new generation of photographers with the exhibition 6x6. Six and included six photographers and 36 works. And these photographers, um, they have become members of UNIAC, which is the Guild of Artists and Writers in Cuba. So the photographers were Rolando Cordova, Alberto Roque, Alfredo Sarabia, Jorge Macias, Sergio Romero, and Isabel Sierra. And the words of the catalog are revealing for the new path of the Cuban photography in the 90s. So I'm going to quote what Jorge de la Fuente, the critic, who wrote this, uh, these words said. And I quote, within the present panorama of Cuban photography, this exhibition represents a turning point in both the cultural practices of local institution, institutions and in the aesthetic value of the Cuban photography. The intimate, metaphor metaphoric, and paradoxically distant vision of these photographs repositions the photographer as a true producer of images, which have been found from within and in the unrepeatable exceptionality of the outside, end of the quote. End of the quote. So De La Fuente somehow cryptic words allude to what has been conceptualized in the 80s as the overcoming of the epic paradigm. That is the quest um, for images that instead of portraying the charismatic leader or the triumphant rally uh, on the streets or the royal worker would zoom in into the fleeting and complex slices of everyday life. So we, you can see here, for example, that photograph by Isabel Sierra, Cordo, uh, uh, another one by Alfredo Sarabia. So you can see the, um, the change of things in the 90s. So in this uh, newly inward allegoric look, which were the new things. So a big thing was the city. And the city, I mean, the representation of the city followed different path. Instead of the place to express the sense of victory, the collective, or the industrial prowess of socialism, it became a site for the invention of geometric forms. Uh, it was the core of chaos and scarcity. It was a place to resolver and a side of nostalgia mixed with urban utopia. So one of the first um, emerging photographers in this new generation, in this new decade, is Jose Ney. And Jose Ney, um, moving away from the oversaturation of people on the streets and the ubiquity of political signs in the urban landscape, he, um, he began to fragment and crop the city to create these geometric patterns. Uh, in which the human component takes, takes a secondary role. So what is important now is the creation of geometric patterns, the rhythmic repetition of, repetition of forms, and the astracization of the urban reality. This is a very um, descriptive image of the special period. This is Ramon Pacheco. Um, Ironically, he was the, the main uh, photographer of Giron, the most official newspaper in Matanzas. So in his spare times, I mean, on the other, I mean, during his working hours, he would go to these rallies on the streets, etc. But in his spare time, he started to wander the streets of Matanzas, his hometown, and he would um, capture this reality uh, surrounding him. So you can see, for example, the city with, um, because of the lack of fuel, it was very difficult to uh, pick up garbage. So you can see the streets strong with garbage or the bodega, the usual bodega with nothing. 
in the shelves, just empty bottles. And then the street, and this is very interesting during the special period, the street became a site in which people would meet, mingle, and they would, uh, that everyday life would unfold because, um, because of the many and frequent blackouts, it was so hot in the inside that people started to live in the outside. So this is Humberto Mayol, the brother of Carlos. And you can see, for example, the barber uh, trimming the hair of his client on the streets, or this woman who has set up a, a booth to sell, foods, uh, to sell food at the bottom of her building. <clears throat> And this is another uh, picture by Carlos Mayol. And this is another example of the street, the city, as the site for resolver, which is the most uh, common Spanish word in Cuba. Resolver means to get by, by whatever means, in order to fix a problem, to find a solution to a problem. So we can see here the man carrying the TV set on a wheelbarrow. Uh, I don't know, we don't know if he, if he stole the TV set from <laughs> the factory or he, um, he's going to fix it. So, a prominent artist who emerged in this, uh, in this years was Carlos Garaycoa. And Carlos Garaycoa, um, this crumbling, neglected city of Havana became the main drop for his work. He transformed that discourse of political utopianism into an, an architectural reverie that longed for advance, for progress. So what he would basically do, and at this time he uh, called himself uh, an urban archaeologist, what he would do would be to photograph these crumbling buildings, buildings in Havana, and then he would proceed to make drawings of the same building, but he would restore to his former glory mm -hmm. these buildings, but he would uh, add some fantastic or futuristic or classical elements to the drawing, as we can see here. Uh, and the title is On Those Tireless Cariatides That Daily Sustain Our Present. Another interesting thing about him is that um, he used Havana, now turned into a crumbling museum of architectural styles, to convey the profound longing of Cubans for development combined with a profound nostalgia for an architectural past that was very wealthy in its variety and its grandeur. So architects, Cuban architects praised themselves and bragged a lot, pre-Castro era, that there were not two identical buildings in Havana. So what he's doing is to making these setups in crumbling buildings and by um, adding this objects from a glorious past, he is combining present with the past. Mm -hmm. So one of his most famous words from that, from those years is Sloppy Joe's Bar Dream, the famous bar that was the hub for Hollywood uh, movie stars and a lot of celebrities. So now it's open and has been restored, but in the 90s was, uh, um, was totally neglected. So the images on the wall were the inside of the Sloppy Joe's, and what he did was to reconstruct the bar, I mean a portion of the bar of the Sloppy Joe, which uh, purportedly, allegedly, was the longest bar in Cuba. And he reproduced the column, the face of Joe, the former uh, owner, and also he made bottles with, uh, with the brand of Sloppy Joe. So reconstructing and reenacting the past became a subversive act. And also the ruin, which is very important in uh, Garaycoa, became the symbol of a collapse of the socialist dream. And then we have the home, and we have, we're back to Pacheco, and he created this serious communal living in 1999, and he began in this communal building that was called the Hotel of the 100,000 uh, 100, Pesos. And it was called like that because allegedly one tenant before the revolution won the lottery. Um, so he began uh, representing the different tenants of the building 
For example, uh, this is a kid whose mother was a prostitute and they have squatted in this apartment. So she would walk the streets at night and she would leave him alone in the apartment. Uh, like this neighbor with, with this very um, expression of apathy. And that reminds me a, a lot of this very, very famous American photographer, Roger Valley, who lives in Jordan, Johannesburg, who started to um, document the lives of isolated um, whites living on the fringes of South African society after the apartheid was lifted and uh, how they were losing their identity. So you can see the similarity of the aesthetic in both photographers, but of course, um, dealing with different approaches. And at some point, Pacheco started to document his own house. So this is his own house, and you can see the ephemerality of the material culture in Cuba at the time, again, pervaded by extreme poverty, and, um, and you know, this, this kind of bleak and very somber interiors with the um, peeling walls, etc. So, so the body became the body became um, a site for um, a territory in which to express the richness of the self and the psychological conflicts on the individual as opposed to the collective. So in this in this period, photographers are going to combine performance and photography. Uh, to as an instrument for an inward look and for social commentary. So we have here Marta Maria Perez, uh, Marta Maria Perez Bravo, one of the first Latin women, female Latin American artists, to work with her body in front of the camera. And she began to deal with Afro Cuban religion. Uh, after 1991, the government finally uh, allowed the practice of different religions in Cuba, something that was very much taboo until that time. And Santeria, because of his nature, became a very, very popular, I mean, uh, Afro-Cuban religion became a very popular uh, religion in Cuba. So she, for example, on, um, on the picture of the right, is called for the offering, and she's enacting when you are initiated in Regla de Ocha, or what in Cuba is called um, commonly a Santeria. You cut your hair because it's to clean up your conscience. Uh, Ex Votos, for example, um, is dealing with this Catholic tradition of, of uh, miracles um, performed in different parts of your body, but at the same time, she was talking about the different areas of influence from Orishas or Afro Cuban deities in different parts of your body. Then we have It is it's in Your Hands on the right that she has uh, fashioned herself as Elewa which also became a very popular deity in Cuba. He, um, he's represented as a child and sometimes as an old man. But Elewa, why he was so popular? Because, because he opens and closes path of life. That's why the title is, is in your hands. It's like my future is in your hands. And then we have protection that has to do with the Congo tradition of the Nkisi, which is this sacred object in which the the spirit inhabits, and the nails um, means that, I mean, the wooden figure stands for you, and each nail seals a medicine or a problem to, uh, that you have at that moment. So it's, it's kind of a compromise between you and the deity. That's why she, again, um, portrayed herself as this in kissing, protected uh, from the dangers of the outside. And then we have Rene Peña, who uh, began to, um, again, to perform in front of the camera. At this point, Robert Mayplethor is very important, very influential for these photographers. And this series, The Cook, The Thief, His Wife and Her Lover, is taken from the famous British-French movie from 1989 with Ellen Mirren that deals with adultery, deals with, um, with murder, cruelty, etc. And the fact that he put, like, for example, this female accessory in his body is talking about travestism, uh, meaning the, the double moral that Cubans have to exercise to navigate the government and the censorship. Um, we have 
queer culture with Eduardo Hernandez uh, presenting uh, gay subjects as modern San Sebastian, mm -hmm. inflicted by different um, um, pain, suffering, and also you know the dismembering uh, and the distortion of the bodies alludes to crisis of integrity. We have migration uh, represented by uh, Manuel Piña with these amazing images of the Malecon or the sea wall, and um, it was taken. It was inspired by T. S. Eliot, Wasted Lands. So it's water wastelands, and you see the picture of the sea wall again because for Cubans is is a curse and is a is a, is an advantage. So it's a blessing and it's a curse the water. And just to finalize, I uh, would like to go back to the documentary practice. This is um, Cuba dura, like tough Cuba, but also like lasting Cuba. And there, there were two photographers very important as documentary um, artists at the time, Cristóbal Herrera and Raúl Cañuano. So on the left, we have Cristóbal Herrera with these very um, impressive images of children. And children, why children? Because children were one of the main tropes of the revolution because they were the future. So in this case, this is a very, again, very poignant, powerful image um, of these two kids in a way like alluding to the different path that these children would take in the future, either to work for the government or either to escape by jumping this barbed wire. And Raul Cañuano, this is a very interesting image that alludes to what Mario was working, uh, talking about at the beginning, because this is the moment when the government decides to close many sugar mills all across Cuba. So many people who, who, whose livelihood was associated with the industry had to, they didn't know suddenly what to do with their lives. They were sent to study um, in different parts of Cuba. And this, uh, this sugar cane leaf, like closing his eyes, is a very metaphorical way uh, to say, to, to, to uh, express the farewell of these people to something that had been the source of national identity, national culture, and the economy. Mm -hmm. And I want to finish with Ricardo and Elias. So this, is, um, this was made in 1999, 2001, the eyes that built history. And I find very interesting that closing the decay, this decay that was so, so painful for so many Cubans, um, in which everybody felt so much angst and hopelessness, he finishes this decay with this series that revises the revolution. And what he basically did was to take pictures on the left of footages of documentaries related to the revolution because every, um, every year, every time there is a historical date or event, the Cuban TV reruns all these documentaries. So he would take a picture of that and then immediately after, he would go to that place and would take the image of the place today. And he, he printed in a way that you could see the successive numbers of the negatives. And what he was basically doing was to reflect about these sites that were so politically charged, so symbolically charged for all Cubans, what was the meaning of those places today? So basically, what is the meaning of the revolution for a generation that was born uh, within the revolution? And what, is, um, what are the significance of all these discourses and places? So um, the, the, the picture uh, at the bottom is during the memorial for the victims of Parvaos, of this plane who was carrying Cuban athletes, and it exploded in mid-air. And this is the memorial um, that took place in the Revolution Square in 1976. So uh, immediately after, he went to the same place. He tried to reunite the same angle, the same view angle of the picture. And as you can see, it's a very empty and silent place. So again, he wants, uh, he wants us to reflect about um, what is the revolution today? If it has become something silent, like a silent meaning, um, a silent symbol, a very quiet and empty show. Oh, thank you. Thank you.